I ended up choosing to go to Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. And that is where I met Kim and uh, Chris's wife. And so, Pastor Chris's wife. And so, Kim and I were at Drake University together. She was a senior, I was a freshman. And so, through that uh, relationship, and then eventually on to the Science Center, that is how we got connected. But as time went on, of course, uh, from college, you, um, you know, you lose touch. And then we got reconnected as they were serving in Wasika at a church there. And my aunt and uncle were living there. And so we got reconnected while they were uh, living in Wasika. And then uh, stay connected with them as we had children, somewhat similar in age, but also continue to reconnect with them over the years. And so really to connect up here, really Glory Baptist has been one of the first churches we got connected with now as my husband's family is from, as Chris's family, Chris, my husband. <laughs> it gets is, confusing. Yes. Um, is from this area. He grew up in Cloquet. And so it really was a blessing that God provided us your church to connect with as we have been coming up to the Northland here for quite some time. And so really to have this home church here really is a true blessing. And so to have Chris, uh, Pastor Chris and Kim here also makes it even more special. So thank you as God has led them here and also as your connection uh, to us and to the ministry in the DR. All right. So then the next question uh, after who are we and what are we, what are we doing here is uh, where's the Dominican Republic? Well, and you have kind of a hint, it's uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Any guesses? The other side of Haiti. All right. Does this one have a pointer on it or not? Yeah, it does. It does. Just got to find the right button for it. I have no idea which button it is. Oh, maybe it's that one. Oh, that's not going to work, though, is it? There we go. Perfect. Yes, yeah, same island as Haiti, same island as uh, uh, right there in between uh, Cuba and uh, and Jamaica and Puerto Rico, and only a couple hour flight from Florida, so it is uh, a great place to uh, to be at and to take a different picture. Every time we take a picture at a presentation, that slide is the one that's up on the up on the display. <laughs> um, but Time Ministries has two locations. Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic, and also Monterey, Mexico. That's actually where the ministry started uh, back in 1968. And our home office is in Des Moines, Iowa. And the goal of time, the goal of, of the ministry that we are privileged to be a part of is to glorify God by leading short-term groups to the mission field. And there's a lot of discussion out there in missions nowadays, if anybody has heard or read of the book, When Helping Hurts, and... and uh, for example, why, why are we spending thousands of dollars to send a team, to send a church down to the DR when you could just give that money to them? Um, but our founders had a very, very specific reason for establishing that ministry, and that was to get people motivated to serve, not only to serve internationally, but to serve locally as well. And so it was hoped that uh, through this ministry uh, of, of, of serving national churches uh, in foreign countries, people would get a, a new spark and a new fire for serving back at home. So the way that, that, uh, that the ministry works, there's two components. First of all, we try to help the local churches, the Dominican and, and the Mexican churches, uh, through construction and evangelism and discipleship. And we've talked a little bit about that in the previous times we'll, we've been here. We'll just go over that very briefly again. Uh, the first one is construction. Uh, and that is through the building of the small churches that we call chapels. Uh, what we have in the DR are, are lots of pastors that are coming out of Bible institutes and training programs, and they may be meeting in a house, they may be meeting under a tarp, they may be meeting under a mango tree, and they need some form of, of, of shelter or a permanent place to house their ministry. Uh, mangoes are pretty dangerous when they fall more than 10 feet, and so you want to get under a shelter. And so primarily when, when our groups come down, they will do a construction project that involves the building of one of these chapels, which can be done in less than a week. And anyone can do this. You don't have to have any construction experience uh, whatsoever. It's all done with templates, and there is, is something for anyone from ages 8 to 80 to participate in, in this project. 
We also do evangelistic outreach. We're down there to share the gospel, to spread the love of Jesus Christ. And we do that through a variety of means. Uh, we do VBS activities, much like you guys would have a VBS program here in the summer. We do sports ministry, uh, sports outreach. Uh, we're getting involved into medical ministries. Um, uh, what else do we have? We've got women's ministries going on. Uh, we've got a MOPS program, a Mothers of Preschoolers program, um, eyeglass clinics. So just about, just about any way you can think of, creative way to share the gospel with someone, to develop a connection with someone, to give you an opportunity to share the gospel, uh, we, we do that. Uh, and then finally, we, we are involved in discipleship. Uh, these are more long-term relationships that typically happen with our interns and, and our staff and youth from the churches that we partner with, uh, building them up and bringing them up in the ministry in the hopes that they too will become missionaries. So that's one of the ways that the, that the national churches benefit from the ministry that, that we're involved in. But we also want you guys to benefit from this ministry, too. As Pastor Chris said, we want uh, you to feel as blessed uh, and to receive as much as you think that you're giving. And so we're hoping through, this, through these trips that you're getting uh, a new insight into global missions. And we'll talk a little bit about that in, uh, in our presentation. So that is uh, a, just very briefly a little bit about, uh, about what we do and how we do it. Um, however, what I, I should have started with here was um, our team, because this is a very cultural thing. In, uh, in the United States, the first question you ask when you meet somebody is what, typically? What do you do, right? In the Dominican, that's not the question you ask. The question when you meet somebody is, how's your family? Or who is your family? It's much more focused on the people than it is on, on what you do. And so I should have reversed my slides. But this is our missionary family down in the Dominican Republic that serve with Time Ministries. Uh, as you can see, we have a good blend of Americans and, uh, and Dominicans who are faith-based supported missionaries. We are all missionaries that uh, raise support through churches such as yours and individuals uh, and so forth. And, uh, and they all have a number of roles within the ministry, too. Uh, for example, in the upper right-hand corner, that very tall gentleman uh, is no way. He is our construction coordinator, so he leads a lot of the construction projects. His wife does a women's ministry. In the upper left, we have John Carlos. He is our sports ministry coordinator. Uh, he also does some of our on-site marketing. If you've ever been to our website or to our Facebook page, and you may have seen videos with, with JC. Uh, his wife, Chris Murray, handles our, our ministry program, so the things like VBS that, that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, of course, our family, I'm the site director, so I am ultimately responsible for this uh, uh, gaggle of a, of a team down there. Uh, my wife, Cindy, handles the finances and some of the group scheduling, but she is beginning to distribute some of that with our new missionaries. Right down there in the lower center, we have Tyler and Rebecca. They are our two newest missionaries. They just came on in the past, uh, in the past uh, uh, month or so. Tyler does uh, sports ministry and construction. Rebecca does group coordination. And it's a blessing to have them on board. And then last but certainly not least, on the lower left is Ms. Toretta Brown, uh, wife of our, of our founder. She is 95 years old and still serving actively in the ministry. And uh, so there's no excuse, unless uh, we've got someone here that's 95 or older, for, uh, for not being able to come down and, uh, and serve in the Dominican. Uh, since we were here the last time, uh, we've also started a leadership development program. This is where we're trying to help uh, bring up new people into ministry and into missions. And so, as you can see here, we have Tyler and Rebecca, who just graduated from that program. We have two Dominicans, Carol and Kenny, who have about a year left in that program. And Lord willing, they will become new missionaries as well. And that is helping us, because our team is getting a little bit bigger now, that is helping us take advantage of some opportunities that we never had time for uh, before. Uh, one of the things that uh, another ministry that we're involved in, uh, I'll let my wife talk briefly about, and that is the MOPS, the Mothers of Preschoolers Ministry. So... We have been on the field for nine years. Uh, actually, we started in 2010, and um, 
And actually, Chris and I will be celebrating this month, May, 22 years of marriage. And um, actually, 21. Whoops, <laughs> I added a year. <laughs> 22 years together, 21 years of marriage. And um, so that means if you look at our children, Paul six, Sophia's three. So we had several years as a couple um, without our children. And as it looks like, God had called us then to have children on the field. It was within the first couple of years that we were on the field in the DR that he called us to have children. And um, when we got there, actually we had just been home for a home visit, landed in the DR in November and found out we were pregnant. That was rather a shock. A little bit later after that, um, I did lose. Uh, we miscarried our first, and then it was later, the April after, that we were pregnant with Paul. But while we were there, we really felt, or I felt, sorry, as we have done this together, um, and Chris has been extremely supportive of this ministry, is knowing and asking women and asking young moms, what do you do? Do you have a group? Do you guys get together? Do you do anything? And they're like, well... I asked my sister, I asked my mom, I asked my aunt or my neighbor, but it really was, they were interested in having a group. So this year we just celebrated our fifth anniversary. And so we now have uh, four groups in the Dominican Republic. And I have also completed my coaching certification with MOPS International, Mothers of Preschoolers. And so I'm helping in all of the Caribbean now and so actually we've been in contact with a coordinator in cuba there are six to eight groups now in cuba of moms um, that have just really popped up in the last eight months and hopefully more and so it's an exciting ministry to see how we can reach families reach moms reach kids to really grow them for christ and strengthen them in, uh, in Christ and in a biblical manner. And as that has happened, um, and so really, Chris, um, that has been one of my roles is um, through the MOPS ministry, but it's also an evangelistic tool that we can also take to other, uh, other churches. But one of the other areas that I really feel that God has been calling us to is a little bit back into education. When I graduated from Drake, I graduated with a degree in chemistry, a teaching license, and started teaching. And so for many years, I was in education, teaching in the classroom, then working in a museum and a zoo, kind of really involved in teacher professional development. And then in 2009, that's when God called us to the field. And I really felt, okay, God, I'll set this aside. You said... Um, you've lost your first love, that I was all about my career at that point, and I set that aside. And it's really been this last year that God's brought it back and said, okay, I think you're ready. So we have been involved uh, with a school, particularly this one called uh, Logos. This is the school where Paul is going to school. Our son is in kindergarten, and this is a Christian Baptist school. It is all Spanish right now, up until third grade, where then they offer um, intense English courses at that time for anyone in the school. But this school has really surprised us. We really feel God has led us to this school, but also some doors are opening for educational purposes. Uh, they are associated with an organization called AXI, Association of Christian Schools International. And AXI is going into other places in the world. They are actually going into Cuba. Through AXI, they have connected with a pastor in Cuba, and they are sharing the gospel. There is Christian education actually happening in Cuba, and it's growing. Parents are desiring it they're seeing their children they're seeing children out of this program really grow and see it differently it's actually an after-school program it's from four to nine uh, for more of ages third grade i believe into eighth and even into ninth grade 
um, but it really is a huge program. So as we've connected with uh, Logos, uh, we have connected with them in helping their own school to connect with Dominican schools. We did an activity, and that's what Pastor Chris was mentioning a little bit about earlier, and seeing how we can connect with Logos on that level, both in the DR, but also as a possibility in Cuba. And so that's what um, I was sharing about. The couple there on the upper left, that is Maria and Karel. Karel is actually Cuban. He is a pastor at a church in an area just about 45 minutes um, west of us. And him and his wife serve there with their children. But his passion has been to go back to Cuba. But Karel and Maria are both teachers and educators at Logos. And so they are that key team going into Cuba and teaching. And that picture in the lower right is the picture of a church in Cuba. That is a picture of Pastor Yanyel's uh, church. That is um, a childhood friend of Carl's, who now has a thriving Christian ministry in Cuba. And it is actually through that church that the Christian education program is growing. And so, it, as I mentioned, it is an after-school program. And so the possibilities just through our avenue of seeking, what do we do for Paul? What is God calling us to do? And so we might have been sharing that about 18 months ago when we were here, saying, please pray for us. We're still making decisions. Well, uh, we're here to say thank you. <laughs> thank you for your prayers. And thank you for all the doors that now God is opening through this school it is more than we could have ever have thought or imagined. And so, as I mentioned, uh, Paul started kindergarten this year. It is um, a great school. He's really enjoying it. His best friend, uh, Marcos, that he's known since he was, I mean, really since he was five months old, because that's when Marcos was born. Paul was born in January. Marcos' birthday is in April. And so they've been together since they were um, babies. And so um, he's really thriving, and it really, truly has been a blessing. Uh, Sophie is also growing up, and she is growing beyond in leaps and bounds for us. It is amazing to see uh, how much she wants to keep up with her big brother. And so she will start preschool also at Logos uh, this year and this September it's a half homeschool, half preschool program. So we do a library program with the school on Wednesdays, and then we have a full classroom on Fridays for her. But also, it's still all in Spanish. And so what we that's a little bit of a wrap-up of all of our family and kind of what's been happening since we were there. But now we'd like to kind of look at what does it mean to go on a missions trip and what may God be sharing uh, with you, or it's a message that he's put on our hearts that we would love to share, love to share with you tonight. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. So we'll get into the meat of the message, and uh, oops, wrong way. And we, uh, we heard that you really like guest missionaries that, uh, that like to speak for a long time. I uh, heard that through the grapevine, so um, we've got some time here. So Cindy said, we're going to talk about... about why we do this, why we feel you should do this, and basically really why we should do anything for the Lord, and it's because of love. It's because we love Him, and especially considering what happened last week because of His love for us, that He sent His only Son to die for us. Uh, what, what more could we dedicate our lives to than serving Him, whether it's overseas, whether it's right here in your own backyard. So, the last time we had uh, growth, I think it was, we had six letters. We cut that down to four for this one, and each one of those uh, stands for something. So we'll start with L, legacy. And we're going to go uh, now into our Bibles. Uh, everybody's got their Bible, right, on their phone or their mobile device. We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 32 through 38. And actually, I probably won't read all of those, but uh, we'll just skim the, the very first section. So Hebrews 11, 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets 
who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. Uh, they were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. Uh, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. Uh, hopefully that won't happen to you on a trip to the Dominican Republic. But um, this legacy, to, to, to just as, as here... Um, you know, we're talking about, about all these heroic prophets and judges and, and so forth and, and, and the legacy now that, that, that the apostles and the early Christians have to be a part of. Um, it's reflective of our ministry. And, and just a very brief history here of, of time ministries. Uh, our founders, Zerrell and Doretta Brown, uh, went to the mission field in 1947. They went to the Dominican Republic. They were some of the first Baptist missionaries in, uh, in the Dominican Republic. Um, Doretta grew up on a farm in southern Minnesota here, uh, near St. Charles, I believe it was, and um, did not grow up a Christian. Uh, her older sister led her to the Lord when she was a teenager. She attended um, Northwestern University, down in St. Paul, that's where she met her husband, Zerrell, who was very eager to become a missionary. And he wanted to go where, where no one had gone before. He wanted to go to uh, um, Sumatra in the South Pacific. And at that time, it was just after World War II. And it was, it was just like uh, some of those Gilligan Island episodes where you had uh, Japanese soldiers who did not know the war was over yet. And as you can see in the picture, uh, when they left for the mission field, they already had two young children, and their mission organization said, no, this is, that's too dangerous. We're going to send you someplace more civilized. We're going to send you down to the Dominican Republic. So that's where they went. And they served there until the early 50s. Uh, from there, they went into Cuba, and they spread the gospel there until Castro came into power. And at that point, they moved over to Mexico and began hosting short-term teams. Up until that point, they hadn't worked with groups or teams. Uh, they had just done their own evangelistic outreach. They had a youth pastor call them up and say, Hey, uh, we know that, you go that you've been working in Mexico. Will you take my youth group there? And Zerrell never said no. He said, Sure, absolutely. And Doretta said, Where are they going to sleep and what are they going to eat and how are they going to get there? Because they had nothing set up. Uh, but they quickly went down, they got some things set up, and that's where they started time ministry in 68. After 30 years of serving short-term groups there, they decided to open up another field, and since they had a connection to the Dominican Republic, they came back to the DR, met with a pastor who had been led to the Lord as an eight-year-old boy by their very first convert back in the 50s. Uh, who, was, who was starting up another church. They partnered together, and that's where we started in Santo Domingo in 1992. And since that time, we have had the pleasure, I know this is really hard to see, uh, but since that time, we estimate there have been 400 of these chapels constructed in the Dominican Republic. Just an incredible, incredible legacy to be a part of. Just like Paul was saying here uh, in Hebrews about those early prophets, to be a part of that legacy, that you can be a part of this legacy, whether it's through prayer, whether it's by giving, whether it's by actually going of a ministry that started in 1947. And Doretta, as I mentioned, she's still alive. She's still actively serving 72 years of ministry. Not 72 years old, 72 years of active ministry. In fact, when they went back to the Dominican Republic, if you do the math, they were in their 70s when they started a new ministry in the DR. So what, uh, what an incredible blessing, what an incredible legacy to be a part of, and you guys can be a part of that too. So that's L, legacy. The next one, something we don't always like to talk about, especially those, those of us with children, uh, and that is obedience. I'll let Cindy talk a little bit about that. So as God was calling us um, and moving us forward to make a decision to go on to the field, there was a scripture 
that really stood out for us, and it was in Luke 5. And this is actually where Jesus is initially calling some of the disciples. And in Luke 5, this is Jesus, um, Jesus has been teaching, but also all of the, or these disciples, and particularly Simon Peter, still Simon at the time, they've been fishing all night. And so we're going to kind of paraphrase it, but in Luke 5, 1 through 11, Jesus decides and sees Simon Peter as they're coming in from the night. And if we start in verse 4, Jesus says, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But... But, because you say so, I will let down the nets. And so, Jesus had seen Simon Peter doing something they know how to do. They were experienced fishermen. And they knew exactly what they were doing. So when Simon Peter says, Jesus, Master, there's nothing out there. There's nothing for me to do. But then, Peter put in, but, but because you say so, I will let down their, your, our nets. So it was the obedience that he had. And so as you're considering, if you're sitting here tonight thinking, I don't know, you know, maybe I'm an electrician. I don't know if that's something that they need. Or I'm a plumber. Do they really need a plumber? Or I'm a teacher. Um, I teach in the schools, or I, I love to sew. It's something that I do all the time, but maybe that's not something they need. You know what? We need it all. We're in the midst of an electrical overhaul, really. Electricity is definitely a high need for us as we are right now praying to complete um, raising funds for a new generator. Um, plumbing? Definitely. <laughs> that is something all the time that happens. Um, sewing. Actually, my aunt came down and redid all the curtains in a house that we have that people can rent or utilize and to stay in, into a team housing. And people go in there now, they're like, oh, it's dark. <laughs> we have darkened windows now. And so all of it, even though it's a talent God has used you, and so we do have Paul and Sue up here, and especially in these particular pictures, because I know Paul had been a teacher. He'd been a teacher for years. But the obedience that both Paul and Sue had to calm down and to say, okay, God, we will let down our nets. We will come. And God used them in a mighty way. The school, actually, where they were teaching, I know that they were extremely blessed and they continue to desire and need science education. I've been trying to help them with the new science lab, but we're also praying for that school as their administrator, the, the woman who had the passion and started a school in a chapel, has now come down with um, stage four breast cancer. Uh, her name is Raquel. And so, but it is just a continuing example as you as a church, as you sent this couple out there, they have touched that heart of that school. And so as we know that the, the key gospel that a lot of times we hear out of obedience in Matthew 28, 18, 20, before Christ um, went into heaven and said, therefore go and make disciples, baptize them, baptizing them in the name of the Spirit, in the name of the Father, and in the Spirit. And lo, I will be with you always. But what we've heard is that word go is actually in Greek, an on word going, as you are going, make disciples. And so it could be going, holding a children's hand, just coloring page with them. Holding a child. If you love children, def 
definitely. There are many children that need to be held and need to be um, just cared for. But also, if you are a leader, if you're in accounting, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> we need accounting. If um, This is a businessman who became a chaplain from Texas. And actually, this is the... Um, This is a gentleman that led the group that came down that you may be working with. His wife is the um, administrator of the Baptist Church, uh, Baptist School in Dallas, Texas. It's part of First Baptist Dallas, and it's First Baptist Academy. And it's his wife uh, who started that. And this is um, this is a gentleman who came, and he actually is a chaplain to businessmen. And so he came and brought four Chinese boys. These are international students, don't know the Lord, and he brought these boys to the DR out of obedience, feeling we need to put something else in front of them to show them Christ. And as he was going, he was also training business leaders here um, from our church next door about the gospel and how to be a Christian leader in the business workplace. So all of it is needed. Whatever talent, whatever God has called you to, I know there's a place for you and that God may have that place for you in the DR. And so we're going to look at a couple more as we continue to see how God may be calling you to the field. All right, we're going to talk about the vine. Abiding in the vine, John 15, 5 through 17. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples." And I'll I'll stop there with that one. So bearing fruit, that is one of the, um, really one of the the key parts of our ministry. And it's something that you can do even in a week's time. In less than a week's time, you could begin the process of bearing fruit. Um, Remember in in a portion of scripture where Paul is talking about not, not everybody plants, not everybody sows, not everybody harvests. But somebody has a responsibility and a part to play uh, in that uh, in that line, and so there are, are so many opportunities, as we mentioned, um, VBS kinds of programs where you're working with kids. You may be doing songs, you may be doing crafts, you may be doing activities, but these may be things that they haven't done before, and maybe it's their first their first contact um, with somebody in a Christian context. But you never know. If you may bear fruit, or fruit may be born from that experience, from that connection in uh, in the future. Uh, Another good example of this, this is kind of a a cutoff picture, but it's really neat because in this picture is Tyler. Remember, he was one of the uh, missionary interns that that we talked about earlier. Uh, Tyler did not have a a good start to life. he, he uh, in his teenage years, he got involved in some things that many teenagers do, uh, involved in, in drinking and partying, uh, not walking with the Lord, even though his mother worked for, for the church. And, uh, and at some point, uh, his pastor convinced him to come down on a missions trip with time. And he had just recently, prior to that, recommitted himself to the Lord. He came down for a short-term trip for a week, such as you guys will, will experience. And he, he really, something clicked within him, and he said, Boy, I, I want to experience more of this. Uh, this was a trip that he took during the month of April. And uh, immediately following that, he said, I think 
the Lord's calling me to come down for a little bit longer period of time as a summer intern. We have a, a summer internship program for uh, kind of college-age students. They come down during the summer months and help us out. Uh, and so he came down during, during that summer and, uh, and served alongside uh, the rest of the missionaries there and, and helped with the groups, helped with the teams and their projects and their activities. And uh, after that, that summer, he, he went back home. And then a few months later, he, he called us up again and said, I'm really sensing the Lord calling me that, that this is maybe something he wants me to do with my life. And at that point, we had just started this year-long internship program called the Missionary Internship. And so he started that in, um, in January of, of last year. And then, just uh, as I mentioned a, a few weeks back, uh, we officially accepted him as a missionary. So he went through this discipleship process, uh, and now he is leading a sports ministry program and he is working with these young kids who are out in a village called Circadio. And, and getting to them, as, as some of you may know, there's a few people in the Dominican that play baseball. And uh, this is, uh, and, and of course you also hear the bad news every, you know, a couple times a year. You hear this news that this baseball player uh, has, uh, you know, gotten in a car accident or was involved in a party, you know, died or killed somebody else. And because they're getting all this money, hundreds of thousands, not millions of dollars uh, from the big leagues, they've never seen that kind of money before. They buy fast cars, they get involved in parties and things, and they die. And what we hope through the sports ministry program is we can get to these kids while they're young, give them Jesus, because many of them are never going to make it to the big leagues, right? And we're not training them to be pro baseball players, but we just simply want to engage them in a place where they may never walk into a church, we're going to go to them, do something that they love doing, play baseball, and share the gospel so that they've got that background in Christ for the rest of their lives, for eternity, literally, not just a career that they may or may not get in baseball. And so seeing that uh, through this whole program, uh, how Tyler has abided in Christ and he's bearing fruit, is just an incredible thing to, uh, to see. Uh, another good example of that is a pastor that we've worked with. Uh, on the left here is a pastor by the name of, of Carlos. We talked briefly about him the last time we were here. Uh, pastor Carlos has, has a ministry in a small village called Pica Pica. Uh, he was a pastor in a fairly good-sized church, but through a variety of circumstances, the Lord led him to this small community. And there we built a chapel for him. Actually, it was the very first chapel that Cindy and I participated in when we went to the mission field in, in 2010. And he, uh, he started up a church. Pretty soon he had three chapels on his property and a basketball court. And he was beginning to train young men in that neighborhood, in his congregation, to be leaders. And after the course of a couple of years, this, this gentleman on the right, uh, Yoni is his name, Johnny, but spelled with a Y, um, he felt led to start a church as well. He hadn't been uh, a believer. Uh, his, his wife and his daughter had started attending this church. Uh, he was involved in a number of, of uh, activities that were not so Christ-centered. Uh, but the Lord kept working on his heart, and he started attending that church. And he tells the story that one day, he, uh, when, when the pastor did the altar call, he, he raised his hands. And he went home and told his wife and kids about that, and they thought he was crazy because he would never do that kind of thing. Uh, but Pastor Carlos has worked with Yoni, raised him up, trained him, discipled him, and now we have built a chapel for him in a village that is just a few miles away where he is, uh, is, is, is leading a congregation. So again, it's such a great process of, of, of bearing fruit um, and abiding in the vine. And it's, it's great to see that, and you guys can be a part of that as well. All right, we're on the last letter, E, experience. So as you've heard some of these stories and kind of listen to different people's stories, is uh, one thing that we always hear uh, almost week after week when people come to the DR is, I don't know, I kind of feel... I feel God's here. I 
really feel God's presence is here. And we wanted to put this picture up. And this is a picture from our rooftop. So early in the morning, it is amazing to go up there and see the sunrise. This is actually a sunrise from our rooftop. rooftop. And to say, or a question we'd like to ask you, are you ready to experience a truly living, awesome God? And so we're going to look at a little bit of scripture that's in Isaiah. And this is when Isaiah truly experienced an awesome God. And it's in Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. At the sound of their voices, and um, the voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hands, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, it touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here am I. Send me. And the idea of sending is, yes, maybe God's asking you to go when they go in December. Maybe God's asking you to give. Or maybe God is asking you to pray. All of those places are important, as every part of the body is important. But through the experience of going, sending, giving, praying, we have a chance to experience the one true holy God. And the opportunities to stand there and to see, there's also kind of to the other side of the picture, there's a mountain ridge. But just to see the vastness, the majesty of our God is amazing. So the experience to say, wow, God, you called me. You called me to go. And so when you think about or maybe considering or praying today, what it is the type of experience? Are you ready to serve, to see an awesome God? To imagine your group and maybe insert yourself in this picture. And to see, are you the one to say, here am I, send me. As we hope that you may consider in any shape or form that God may be calling you to help pray, to help give, to help go, to hold that child's hand, to share that word of encouragement, whatever it may be, um, We pray that through legacy, through obedience, through considering abiding in the vine and the type of experience you may have in the DR, that you would continue to pray and how God may use you in this endeavor. Amen. Amen. And... Just the uh, one quick thing I want to add on to that is is the idea that you may be saying, as Cindy mentioned earlier, well, what can I do? Our biggest misconception when when we thought about missions and ministry was, well, I'm not a pastor. I didn't go to Bible school. I'm not a pastor. That's not my background. Um, I went to school for aviation, and then I worked in a science museum. You know, Cindy was a teacher. Um, 
We're not pastors, but that's what missionaries are. But no, anything you can imagine doing in the secular world is something that is needed in ministry, right? You can't, uh, you can't have a functioning facility without somebody that knows how to run a facility. Electrician, plumbing, is, is, as Cindy said. You need to have somebody that can handle the finances. You need to have somebody who can teach. You need to have somebody who can, who can preach. You need to have somebody who can play sports. You, there's just, uh, you need somebody who can fix vehicles and drive vehicles, right? So whatever you do, do it for the Lord. And if you're thinking maybe God is calling me to do this full time, there's a way to do that somewhere, someplace. Again, overseas or right here in your own backyard. So with that, we, uh, we are right at the top of the hour. We're at 8 o'clock. And, uh, and we wanted to give an opportunity for any to ask any questions, if you had any, about the Dominican Republic, about time ministries, uh, anything at, at all. Um, we're here. Don't everybody all ask at once. No question is too silly. No dumb questions. The only dumb question is the one you don't ask. Yes, ma'am. To Chile, oh, to Cuba. Uh, Cuba, you would uh, we would get there by by plane. Um, there are direct flights from the DR into uh, into Cuba. There's a, a couple of airlines, um, or or going from from the states. Uh, JetBlue, American Airlines, they all fly into into Cuba as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. And pray for that that situation. We just. I think I was just looking in the paper the other day. It sounds like uh, the president has put down some more sanctions on Cuba. That may make it harder to travel. That's one of the reasons why we, why we have this discipleship program of, of training up missionaries because it's going to be always easier for a Dominican to go to Haiti, or excuse me, to, uh, to Cuba, than it is an American, at least for the foreseeable future. So even if we can't get there, hopefully we can get our Dominican brothers and sisters over there helping to share the gospel too. Yep. Any other questions? Yes. We were sent a team there. Would we be headquartered in uh, San Domingo, and then would we be working there? Would we? Right. So generally, what what would happen is our our facility. And we didn't really show a picture of that. Uh, our time facility has the, the the small apartment where we live, where our interns live. It has dormitories, so we can house 50, 50 girls, fifty guys. It has the bathrooms and the showers, um, the dining facility. And so that's where you sleep. That's, that's where you, you eat uh, almost all your meals. The construction projects, the, the chapels, we prefab those, those materials there on the site. And then as a team, we go out to the location at the end of the week to, to put up the chapel. And in addition, we go out to different locations to do ministry in the afternoon. All right, so uh, generally mornings we're at, at the site doing the construction when it's a little bit cooler. Uh, although that time of the year, December, it is absolutely gorgeous down there and a um, um, little bit less humid, uh, a little bit cooler in the mornings as well. Uh, but at any rate, we're, we're headquartered in, uh, in our ministry center there. Yep. Good question. Good logistical question. Yes. Ah, good question. Well, when the ministry first started, remember that story I was telling about the youth group that wanted to, to go into Mexico. So originally it stood for Teen Institute for Missionary Evangelism. Well, then they started getting a lot of different mixed groups, adult groups, family groups, and they changed it to the Institute for Missionary Evangelism. Pretty creative. Um, nowadays, we, we really don't use that anymore. Uh, we just call it Time, time Ministries. Yep. Any other questions? Your local cuisine said that they be eating a lot of beans and rice. Ah, yes. Yep. Uh, yes, and so a lot of, Cindy actually all quote. of our kitchen staff has been trained by Doretta. And with that, we also get some nice Minnesota-type um, recipes. And meaning uh, chicken a la cane, chicken pot pie, uh, sloppy joes, pancakes. Uh, but what we try to do in the midday is do more Dominican. So typically our breakfast and our evening meals are very similar to uh, American meals. 
But our midday meals are our Dominican meals. So that's beans, rice, uh, chicken. Uh, that really is what they call la bandera, the flag. That's the national dish. And then, um, but it is not spicy at all. Uh, it is with a lot of, yes, cilantro and some other spices, but fairly mild. Um, and people tend to love it. All of it is homemade. And so we really don't use a lot of processed foods at all. So right now, even avocados are coming into season, season mangoes, um, pineapple, papaya. So there's fruit at every breakfast and vegetables at all our other meals. And so, yes, it is a wonderful. Also, if there's any allergies, especially gluten, if you have any gluten allergies, very accommodating. There's a lot of root vegetables that are good alternatives and a lot of rice. And so we use a lot of rice and rice and beans mixed together too. So gluten allergies typically do very well. Um, so no worries there if you have those. People come down thinking, oh, this will be great. I won't really like the food. It'll be a good diet for a week. I'll be working and building. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Food is, is excellent. Do ever include any, any slides of accommodations? You know, if you, when you look at a very age group of people mm -hmm. that could come down there, you know, it's really neat to see some of the slides that you got. But having been some other places in the world, when I'm going to make a trip, I'd like to see where I'm going and what my account You bet. And I can, I can, get, those, I can get those to Pastor Chris. Um, but yeah, as, as, as we mentioned, the, um, the building that we're in has um, uh, the, the two dormitory facilities uh, for, for the sleeping arrangements, but we also have, Cindy mentioned this briefly, uh, a, a two-story building called the Time House, and that has individual rooms with uh, hot water and air conditioning. Uh, yeah, Paul and Sue, you guys stayed in those, right? So that's, that's more accommodating to the more mature uh, 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 audience. Uh, youth groups, you guys probably still need the cold showers for the experience um, and, uh, and the dorm housing. But yes, we, uh, and, and again, uh, flushable, you know, the toilets flush and, and, and sinks. So uh, yeah, it is very, very accommodating. And uh, we, we try to make it, as comfortable as we can for you, but also make sure it, it is a missions trip, after all, as well. And we also do have a, our own cistern, so we do not use city water. And so for showers and uh, bathing, you know, definitely using that. But uh, for drinking and brushing teeth, we have all bottled water. And so that's available 24-7. So every minute of the day, we're really encouraging people to drink water, keep hydrated. And so um, that is available at all times. And so there's running water. Um, and we also, there are rolling blackouts um, in the city, which means we do lo lose city power, but we have a generator that then kicks in and then that runs all of our equipment. And then also in the house that Chris was mentioning in those more private rooms, um, yes, there's air conditioning, a hot water heater, and so there's more accommodations in that house versus our main building where we have more of the dormitory. So we do have accommodations for all types that are looking for it. So, anything else? How big is city of San Domingo? San Domingo is estimated about three million. It's probably a little bit bigger than that because. Um, when they did the census back in 2010, we heard stories that, that the census guy would walk up to an apartment and he would ask someone, how many people live in this building? And, they, and the person would say, oh, I think there's maybe about 30 or 40. Okay, and they go to the next one, they knock on the door, nobody would answer, and they go to the next one. So how accurate that number is, but it's, uh, it's a big city. I mean, especially my, you know, myself growing up in Cloquet. I mean, I've been to Minneapolis, but the thing is about, about the DR, everybody's outside at once too so it, it feels bigger where we are we're kind of on the outskirts of town the the, the time center uh, we're up on the northern side of the city uh, so beyond us is is getting out into the into the farmland in the country um, but there's always activity going on there's always activity going on anything else all right yes 
You know, we do have a nice lot next door. We've been talking about putting a, a pool in. We do sometimes put a, a little one up on the roof for the kids to play in. So. Yeah, we have done that. We have put, yeah, um, heated by the sun. Yeah, yeah, under direct sun on the roof. So we have had to be somewhat creative for our kids. And so we did get a small swimming pool for them this year. And we put it, put it up there. And so I even remember when Paul was little and I was trying to find something to do. And I literally took a Tupperware tote and I took it up to the roof and I filled it because we do have a, um, a spigot up there, you know, and the water goes all the way up there and it would fill it up. And I'm like, okay. Here you go. Here's your little pool. <laughs> and I put Paul in the Tupperware tote on the roof. So we kind of got creative, but the roof is a magical place. It really is. And so we've done a lot there. We've put a swing up there for the kids, uh, even, but, um, it is a place, um, in the mornings where we also have our devotions. And so to see that sunrise and to see God's majesty every morning, that's a true blessing. Uh, from the center of the beach is about 45 minutes. Uh, that's kind of the joke in the DR. Everything is 45 minutes um, away because of, because of the traffic. But uh, to get to a, a good a good beach, the the coastline along Santo Domingo is all rocky. It's a rocky coral coastline, so you've got to go a little bit further east to get to where the sand beaches are. But that is one of the things that we do with all the groups besides. The work, besides the ministry, we want you to experience the culture too. So we do a beach day. We take you down to the the market where you can buy souvenirs. Um, you see some of the some of the early history of of um, really the first city uh, in uh, first European city in the in the Western Hemisphere. So we include that as a part of our trip too. Because that was really a passion of Zeril's. Zeril um, Zeril was someone who worked hard but also prayed hard, but played hard. Um, he had so much energy. I served as an intern in 1996, and that was actually the summer he passed away. In early August, he had a stroke. And I remember getting woken up from Doretta, and they had rushed him to the hospital. And even to this day, when I talked to her about that summer and having served with them that summer, Joey always goes, wow, I know, that was a summer Zero was so sick. And I go, what? Zero was sick? I'm like, I know he had the stroke, but this man kept going and going and going. And yeah, I mean, mid-70s, he would take a nap after lunch and, you know, but he had such energy. He really went until God decided to take him home. But he really wanted both youth and all of us to really consider there is the cultural aspect along with working hard and evangelizing hard for Christ. And so all three aspects he wrote into his founder's notes and really his passion for the organization. All right. Well, I think uh, in interest of, of some of the folks that maybe want to, uh, to get home, uh, if pastor doesn't mind, I, I can close with some prayer. We'll be at the table there afterwards. We have our prayer cards. Please take, take one of those and uh, put us on your fridge or in your Bible. Pray for us. Uh, pray if the Lord may be, may be seeking you to participate in some way for a triple time ministries. Let's pray for, pray for these two and then we'll wrap up. Got a little here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Father God, we thank you for the words that we have heard tonight, inspirational, challenging, Lord, and maybe, uh, maybe even life-changing, that we might be able to go and be part of this wonderful ministry. We thank you for Chris and Cindy and their family's diligence in, in serving in these magnificent ways as they've described and their continued ongoing work. And God, as we may uh, love and support them, uh, lead us and guide us in that. And may we all pray for them and support them as you would provide for us. And God, uh, Lord, just create opportunities that we might partner with them. And if you're tugging at our heartstrings today, may we, may we acknowledge that. Uh, may we be obedient. May we step out in faith, take a little bit of a risk, and maybe go to the DR and try something new and see how you might use us in an amazing way. And God, truly, we want to make much of you. We want to share your good news, your glory, the gospel with all that we come into contact with. So strengthen us to that end, Lord. We thank you for these inspiring words tonight. As we go forth, may we be your hands and feet in Christ, uh, just loving the world wherever you do send us. 
Thank you for all that you've given us. We praise you in Jesus' high and holy and beautiful name. Amen. Let's give them a hand. Thanks for coming tonight.